Yeah, I can see it. Okay, cool. So, hey everyone, welcome to um, another Future Incubator training. Um, this one is called How to Go Up or Step Up at Your Fundraising. Um, and today we have Jay Cameron with us. So, Jay Cameron's pronoun she day is a development consultant with over 10 years of experience in fundraising. They've worked with arts and human services organizations throughout the US and Canada, serving as a development director and develop director of institutional giving. Um, Jay has a master from, uh, a master, Jay holds a master of women's and gender studies from the University of British Columbia and has planted a million trees during the past career as a reforestation worker in Northern British Columbia and Alberta. So. Um, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Jay. Hey, everyone. So just confirming, can everybody see my skill up your fundraising first slide there? Yes. Awesome. Great. Well, thanks for the introduction, Esther. I actually think it's like 999,000, which is very disappointing. Um, but hopefully I'll get that last thousand in sometime. <laughs> um, I know we have a smaller group today. I was going to ask folks uh, to type in the chat which organizations they're in and if you're comfortable talk about the size of the organization so how many folks you work with um, we'll talk about larger organizations and smaller organizations today and hopefully a lot of what we cover will work for both um, and for everything please feel free to reach out if you have questions you can put your hand up you can throw it in the chat or if if you don't want me to go on and you want to hop back to something just let me know we have a lot of time and space to to check in so this presentation is called Skill of Your Fundraising because we'll be talking about fundraising broadly and its goals and its role within the organization. I'm gonna hop into what we're covering today. Um, we're gonna talk about the forms that fundraising can take. So where funding can come from. We're gonna talk about fundraising activities or what's been called the fundraising cycle by some. And we're gonna talk about how we can track success. So the goal of the beginning here is to talk about the full scope of fundraising and really complicate this idea that fundraising is just one thing and specifically just one uncomfortable thing, like asking for money. And hopefully we're also gonna show how fundraising overlaps with programming and the ways in which that fundraising is really dependent on every single role at an organization. And from there, we're gonna shift into community-centered fundraising. So thinking about how to involve all full team in fundraising and to really learn from our supporters. We'll walk through what that looks like, and we're gonna go through four strategies to create a supportive and lower stress fundraising environment as a team. And at the end, we'll have some space for questions, and I wanna leave us some next steps. Great. So let's hop in to where can funding come from? So fundraising is a lot of things. Uh, for a lot of people, when you talk about fundraising, the assumption is it's hosting one huge gala or just getting money from the Gates Foundation, which I hear a lot. What about the Gates Foundation? Um, and that's it. But the reality is for that, most nonprofits, uh, a healthy revenue stream involves a lot of different fundraising activities. And I'll go through these, but know that they're not exhaustive and that every organization does things a little bit differently. So the first fundraising activity involves individual giving. So that's maybe what folks are most familiar with, you know, one-time donations, uh, monthly giving, which is scheduled donations, either monthly or quarterly, peer-to-peer -peer support like Facebook giving, uh, mutual aid and volunteerism. The second is grants or what's been termed institutional giving sometimes. Uh, and that's private foundations like the Gates Foundation, like some community-based foundations where you submit a request for proposals or letter of intent and usually for funding about a year down the road, depending on the foundation. There's corporate foundations, which are really similar, um, but tied to a company with their specific mission. And then there's government state funding. And that can be either incredibly extensive at the federal government level, or a little bit more accessible and super community focused um, at a local level. There's corporate funding, which includes corporate sponsorship. So either for an event or a program, uh, in-kind company donations like yoga mats from a yoga store, or even in-kind donations of time. So somebody who has a background in accounting or an accounting firm giving a couple hours to your organization every month uh, to help you with that asset. Um, or there's company matching funds, which 
ties into individual giving where if somebody from a company that offers matching funds donates, the company will double that donation. And I can walk through this with you all later. It's um, an underutilized form of giving, uh, but requires a little bit of oversight. Um, and I have a full list of those things that I'll just share with everyone so you have it. And in the other category here, there's uh, lesser known, but some, some spaces where you can also gather funding through donor advised funds, which you don't necessarily apply for, um, endowments or funding through land, earned income, uh, planned giving or giving through wills, membership fees or programming fees, and increasingly uh, crypto and stock donations coming from nonprofits. So I imagine that many of you are aware of a lot of these, but I bring it up because I want us to keep all of these different types of giving in mind when we think about the rest of this work. And I'm going to share a quick chart with you here. Right here, you're going to see a pie chart outlining where all funding came from, um, from in 2021. So this is from the Giving USA 2021 report on all donations to all charities and nonprofits in the United States. So you'll see a really high percentage is individual donations. And around 20% of all funding is coming from foundations and 4% from corporate giving. So bequests here means uh, what I was thinking, talking about before with planned giving uh, or giving through a will. So this won't be your exact breakdown of funds, but it's really helpful to see what's out there and where the majority of funding is coming from for nonprofits across the United States of all budget sizes. What I have here are two examples of two very different organizations and how they break down their funding streams. On the left, you're gonna see uh, the Environmental Defense Fund with a budget of $201 million, which is wild um, when I was looking into their 990 this week. And on the right, you'll see uh, an organization that I've worked with in New York City that has a budget of, of between 200 and $250,000. For both, you're gonna see the strong mix of individual giving, corporate support, foundations, and some other income streams. And when you're looking at this breakdown, there's really two main points that I want you to take away. So the first is when you're looking at funding sources, there's a lot of different places to connect with. And each organization's breakdown is gonna look different depending on their mission. If you wanna work with companies, it might be much higher. You know, if you have a mission that aligns with that work, um, if you're really community driven, you might find sources more through mutual aid and, and individual donations. Um, but that leads me to my other point, which is any healthy fundraising plan includes multiple sources of revenue. So it's recommended that no more than 20% of your funding comes from one source, unless it's individual giving, um, because individual giving is relatively unrestricted, which means that you can use it where it's needed where a lot of grants and corporate support goes to a specific program. Right. So as we go through a little bit more detail about fundraising activities and building fundraising into programming, I, I want you to think about these pie charts here and think about different audiences that we're speaking to and different audiences that we're working with. So any questions on the data so far? You can throw them in the chat or just uh, pop in. Oh, fun fact, gala. That's amazing. We are going to talk about galas. I have a lot of feelings about them. So Alexander asked, do you see trends of nonprofits offering services or booking contracts for revenue? That's a really good question. I, I've personally seen that with the organizations I've worked with. Yes. Um, is it a trend in the larger landscape? Earned income revenue streams seem to be about the same year over year in terms of total donations. Where we're seeing a slight growth is corporate donations and individual donations. Um, and we're seeing increasingly this year a little bit less in corporate donations. So there was a big response in 2020 from companies and that response has backed off. That won't be surprising to many folks in the field. Um, with companies, it can be really tricky. It is very dependent on what they want to spend and why they want to spend it versus foundations, which have a mandate to spend down their endowment every year. However, I have seen it, earned income can be a real stable force for an organization. It also has the potential to um, take a lot of resources. 
So like anything, and then we're actually gonna get into this in the next slide or next few slides, um, it's useful to think about how much time am I putting into these efforts and how much time am I putting into these spaces? Um, is it worthwhile for me to develop a whole income, earned income strategy and what do I project I'll, I'll make over that in the next couple of years? Great. Um, Jiva, you asked uh, what kind of avenues do nonprofits take in order to get funding from these streams? Yeah, that is a really good question. Um, and that I think, I wish I had all the answers for it. Um, I will get into some of that in, in the conversation that, that follows. Um, but a lot of it is in identification and prospect work. And we're gonna talk about that shortly. So identifying where you have an opportunity, where you're aligned, uh, who your current supporters are um, and where you can build those relationships. I wish it were as easy as getting a corporate sponsorship tomorrow from a company that you haven't worked with in the past. Um, sometimes that happens, I, but usually it's because the work is at the level where it's being recognized um, at, at a really high scale. So it, it is a lot of uh, work to secure those partnerships. And we'll talk about that in the next two slides where we talk about what those actions are to actually build that support. Great. And Alexander also asked, uh, this may be later in the presentation, but wondering if more earned income is a way to help adjust during the forecasted recession. Yes. <laughs> um, where individual and corporate giving may be reduced. Um, yes and no. It depends on what your earned income stream is. Because if you're pitching to, to companies specifically, a lot of their cuts are going to come at corporate donation level, but definitely at professional development levels. And a lot of that earned income comes through professional development. Um, that's not exclusive. You'll know your service better than anyone else. If it's recession proof, nothing is, but like if, if you think it can survive through that. Um, foundations do still have to pay down a certain percentage of their endowment. So they're a safer bet during this time. Uh, recessions, there's some incredible data on development during 2008. Um, and other crises for the United States that I'm happy to share with folks after the presentation. Uh, broadly, we often see small hits from individual giving, uh, but rebounding when you continue to connect with supporters and especially long-term supporters. So I'll share a little bit more about that afterwards and, and I'll hunt down that report that talks about this work. That was definitely a big topic of conversation in 2020 is what happens during a crisis, what happens during a recession, uh, how do we pivot our fundraising efforts and I think a lot of what we're gonna cover in this conversation is gonna be helpful for those efforts. Great, cool. So I will continue on um, and we're gonna talk about the fundraising cycle. So let me just pull the chat here. Great. So for each type of fundraising, development professionals have four to five standard fundraising cycles. So actions that we take to secure a gift. These include identification and research. So some people separate those, but I think they're quite similar, which is figuring out if a person, company, or foundation wants to make a gift to your organization. Cultivation, which is telling potential donors about the program, inviting them to events, sharing updates on social media, and broadly showing them why they should give without directly asking them to donate. Solicitation, which is asking for money, submitting a grant, or requesting support in some way, and stewardship, which is a thank you or donor recognition. This is a, a fun development question, and you know, stop me if you've seen this before because it's it comes up quite often in fundraising spaces. Um, but given the actions of identification, research, cultivation, solicitation, and stewardship, I want folks to guess which one of these actions we should spend our most, the most of our time on? And what percentage of our time should be spent on each action? So you can throw ideas in the chat here. Um, some of you may have played this game already and you can see where I'm going here, um, but let's go piece by piece. So how much time out of 100% uh, do you think you should spend on identifying and researching prospects or people who might donate to your organization, foundations who might or donate to your organization? I'll say 10 to 15 percent. Okay. I'm hearing 10 to 15, 10, 20, 10. 
great. Um, and how much time should be spent on cultivation? So inviting people to events, telling donors about your programming, keeping folks up to date. 50, 30, 25, 20. Mm -hmm. Great. How much time should be spent on the ask? Submitting grant, asking for money, asking for support. Got 10, 60, 35, 15 to 20. Yeah. And then finally, how much time should be spent on stewardship for? The thank yous, the donor recognition, that last piece. 15 here, 15, 10 to 15. Great. 10. Yeah. So one of the reasons that we share this in, in fundraising uh, is because it's meant to be shocking. According to best practices in the field, between 80 to 90% of your time should be in cultivation. So the most important work you do in fundraising is showing the donor what your organization does and why it matters. I know, um, but I'm gonna explain why and I'm gonna provide some strategies on that as well. So just to give some clarity, 1% should be on solicitation and the remainder is in between stewardship and research or identification. And this is just coming from how donors stay with you and how they learn about your organization. Um, it's the best investment you can make with your time is really connecting with supporters and future supporters and giving them a reason to donate. And what I hope you leave with is the majority of you are already doing this work. That is the work. That's the programming that you do every day. Um, it's not how we think about development, but it's how we think about programming. And that's why I want to walk through community-centered fundraising today, because I want us to think about fundraising as a more holistic um, activity that the whole team engages in. The majority of people who are going to donate to your program, they're not donors first, they're supporters first. They're people who care about your work and mission first. So how are they finding out about you? How are you talking to them? And how are they given opportunities to donate in the future? So now that we have a broad sense of where we fundraise from and which actions fundraisers take to secure gifts, I wanted to spend a quick moment on how we track success. So tracking success is really important when we're planning new fundraising activities, which I hope we kind of pull from this, this workshop. Um, tracking and data really helps you to adapt and to make decisions, to see what's working right now and what's working long-term. So I want you to be able to say, I'm increasing my cultivation efforts because 80% of my time should be there, um, but because I wanna see new donors. Or I'm tracking how many people move from prospect to donor for one year because I'm investing in those cultivation efforts. Or I wanna keep more of our donors. I wanna spend less time finding new donors. So I'm working on my stewardship efforts. Uh, and on this slide right here, you're gonna see four metrics that you can use outside of money raised to think about success. The first I had alluded to earlier, and it's called uh, cost per dollar raised. So it's broadly asking, how much money does it take to hold the fundraising activity versus how much money do you actually receive? And this is why I always question galas and say, okay, well, how much are we gonna bring in versus how much staff time, how much material time, um, how much review time, how, how much uh, in general things for the gala we need. Uh, but this is also really important for an end of year campaign. So what? how many people are we trying to reach? Uh, what do we expect the return to be? How much staff time is it gonna take to look into this? Uh, and what does it follow up? So I'd encourage you to sketch that out, really spending time on staff time um, and be really clear on your capacity. Because the first thing that happens after any development meeting is, okay, well, I'm gonna do 50 things and they're all gonna take all of my time and they're all incredibly important. Um, so I think that cost per dollar raise is always an important thing to think about, and it's particularly important to think about in terms of cultivation and existing programming. The second is donor conversion rate. So how many people take the desired action during a solicitation or during an ask? When you send a request to donate, how many people are donating? This metric helps us to track engagement. So you asking the right people, at the right time with the right request. The third is donor retention rate. 
And this one I think is really important um, when we think about cultivation and stewardship. So it asks, what percentage of donors do you keep every year? The 2020 overall retention rate tracked by the Association of Fundraising Professionals states around 40 to 41% of donors stay year over year as a baseline for organization. I know that is good. Yeah, it was much lower. <laughs> um, I think people are moving up their efforts. Um, and I think people are also really invested in seeing more long-term change. So in fundraising, if we're seeing a really low number here, if we're seeing only 10 folks, um, to some extent that could be mission-driven. If you're, if you're a crisis-based organization, it is hard to have a high donor retention. And that's not necessarily something that you can change uh, with other uh, outreach. However, um, it can talk a little bit to how we're keeping our donors engaged um, and our stewardship work and the thank yous and, and follow-ups and opportunities for engagement that we're creating. To speak a little bit to our cost per dollar raised framing from earlier, it takes much less time and much less resources to keep a supporter than to acquire a new one. So it's a really important metric to think about and to work on. Great. And the fourth one that I've offered is donor growth rate. So tracking the number of donors that you have every year, which ties to outreach efforts. So how are you reaching new donors? How are you talking to the people in the organization who are coming in and how are you converting people into donors? Great. And I just wanna quickly address Kimberly, you said, are you gonna cover converting supporters to ongoing donors and messengers of the work? Yes, I think that falls into cultivation efforts, Kimberly. And I think that's a huge part of how do you keep that going on and, and how do you engage them in a way to be more in an ambassador space? Uh, I'm gonna to speak to the importance of that and we can talk through activities to make that uh, a reality at the end of the presentation. Thanks. Great, so what's really important about these metrics is they give us a really clear set of actions. If my donor retention rate's falling, I have to ask, you know, what happens after a donor gives? What are my stewardship actions? What communications are they receiving? How are they being recognized in the program? It helps me to see the gaps and the spaces that the organization needs to grow and the spaces that you're doing really well at. I want you to celebrate that as well. Um, and what I found after 10 years in this field is that so much of that work isn't really led by fundraising. It's about the full team working together. And that's what we're gonna talk about next. This idea on how to integrate fundraising actions into your mission so that you're practicing identification, cultivation and stewardship at every stage of the work. Great, so before I move on, does anyone have any questions about metrics or tracking? Um, I'll send how to's on all these. A lot of these you can, you can um, find uh, and they're, they're pretty easy metrics to pull if you have existing supporters and I'm happy to share uh, how to's on those as well. Great. Perfect. Great. So we've talked about how fundraising isn't just solicitation or isn't just the ask and that less than 1% of your time is really spent on asking for money. And one of the ways that we're focusing on this is thinking about community-centered fundraising. And this builds off a term uh, called a culture of philanthropy in the development field, and also work by Vu Li, um, who runs Nonprofit AF on something termed community-centric fundraising, uh, both of which really challenge the way that fundraising has historically been separated from programming and unconnected from the communities that we serve. Yeah, it's, I will also send a link to Nonprofit AF at the end because absolutely worth checking out and, and reviewing. It's, it's pretty exceptional. Great. Um, I've included this really short quote from the Haas Foundation on what a culture of philanthropy can look like um, because it recognizes that a supportive fundraising environment makes funding decisions based on what the community needs. That's also about shifting from a sense of charity to one of mutual responsibility mutual support and opportunity. So I sent out some workbooks uh, before this call. And one of the questions that I asked was, is there any fundraising activity that you don't like? And it's a question that I ask a lot um, and you're free to write it in the chat if you feel comfortable doing so. Um, but I ask it a lot, um, especially with board members. Reporting, because... reporting. Oh, oh yes, <laughs> cold calling is, I think, I don't know a single person who likes cold call. I had one board member who liked cold calling and uh, they were a gem, 
and it was amazing. Um, but absolutely, it's a, it's a tough one. And uh, I think that there can be a really uncomfortable feeling a lot of the times with fundraising. Um, and I often hear people saying something like, I just don't like asking for money. You know, and money is super weird. You know, it's, it has all of this meaning and all this value. And it makes sense that if you think about fundraising as just asking for money, it can be really uncomfortable. It can be really hard to talk about. And it can be really hard to get the full team on board for. Um, and what I'd like to offer is a different way of thinking about fundraising and one that I've seen help organizations succeed. And that is community-centric fundraising. So community-centered fundraising asks, why is your mission important? What does your community need? And who benefits when we address inequity? So when I ask this question instead to board members, they have a really different response. They're way more open to, to answering that question and asking people to support the organization like they've supported the organization because they believe in it, because it's important, because everyone benefits from the success of the organization. Every gift, whether that's of time, mutual aid, money, grants, sponsorship, is a partnership built on trust. And fundraising isn't about the gala or the Gates Foundation as step one. It's about connecting with supporters, about engaging with the people that we serve, the people who support us, and the team that makes that work possible, and valuing the multiple ways they support the organization. So community-centered fundraising doesn't mean it's all about money, and it absolutely doesn't mean that everyone asks for money at all. So it's not about telling your program team everybody has to ask for donations and everyone has to cold call right now, uh, because that will probably end really badly for everybody. Um, but what it does mean is that the fundraising activities of cultivation, stewardship, and identification resonate within the organization. So we're focusing on building relationships and thinking long-term. Okay. So here I've listed four strategies built from uh, the pillars of a culture of philanthropy to help us think about identification, cultivation, and stewardship in your programming. And I'm gonna go through each one to provide a bit more context, including some activities that you can do as a team or, or individually um, to think about how to integrate that work into your fundraising and into your programming. And the goal here is to have these really specific strategies for your team to take on after the workshop. Right. So the first is building a shared responsibility for fundraising. It's important that every member of your team understands the fundraising goals, how their work overlaps with those goals, and why it matters. So most people in the organization, really across every position, can and most likely do engage in relationship building. They meet your supporters, they connect with the people you serve, um, they talk to folks within the communities uh, that you work in and serve in and find support from. Uh, you can skill up every position at your organization by letting them know what to do if someone expresses interest in donating or volunteering their time. So you're not missing any opportunities and you're working as a team to identify any possible prospect for the organization or any opportunity to further cultivate someone and move them into a space where they can uh, have an opportunity to provide support for the organization. So an example uh, from my work is uh, when I worked as a development director, I used to host monthly meetings with the program team and during those meetings, I would share with the full program team what my goals were for that month and what campaigns I intended to run. So as little as I want to run an end of year campaign in about a month, I'm going to reach out to all of our past donors. I also want to reach out this year to volunteers. Is that OK? Because they're super invested and we're invested in the same communities. Um, I would also make that a space for the program team to tell me what they needed. That was where I would hear, you know, we don't have enough money for the translations that we need. It turns out we need a lot more. Or this one community we're working in has a resource need that we didn't anticipate. We need about $15,000 to cover it. And that way I could shift my work as a fundraiser to reflect what was needed um, and also make sure that I was building space for that. And after one of those meetings, I had a program member come up to me and say, you know, I've been working with a volunteer who says they can get us a free space for the gala. Would we want that? 
And uh, that was this big moment of like, absolutely, we would want that. Always come to me with that. Um, but providing that space for people to share fundraising and program goals in the same space is really important uh, and builds those opportunities to really identify prospects and find ways to cultivate them. Great. The next strategy you can build in is integrating fundraising, integrating and aligning fundraising with your mission. So it's thinking about how fundraising fits into your existing programming um, and how your fundraising efforts are in line with the work that you do. So in other words, we're asking fundraising questions in a program meeting. So when the programming is coming up for uh, say a volunteer event in the community, you're asking, is there a space for donors in the event? Have we invited them? How are we following up with everyone there? How are we cultivating the people who show up again and again? Are we giving them other spaces to connect with the organization? Are, are we finding ways um, for them to, to further engage with us? Uh, so I have a short activity here, uh, which I propose to think about how you can better integrate fundraising into the work you're already doing uh, and not create whole new programs to find that fundraising space. So you can ask where donors are coming from in current programming, if they're uh, attending anything, if they're invited. And from there, really think about each staff member's role. So are they thanking donors? Are they including information on how to donate and things like that? Okay. The next strategy is focusing on fundraising as engagement. So one way to build identification and cultivation into your work is to think about how donors first find you and how they hear from you. Development research shows that donors are most likely to give when they feel involved with an organization. They're most likely to give again when they feel recognized for that gift. So when donors are provided opportunities to learn more about the work or see it in action. We're also seeing increasingly year over year that the majority of donors are coming in through social media. They're learning about the organization and other communication streams. And those might be streams where you're not thinking that you're talking to donors, but you are. Um, so one suggestion is to ask donors how they heard about you and how they wanna hear from you, how you can engage them in some way. Um, and I found a survey is actually really great. People really like to tell you why they're doing a good thing and, and uh, I think it's also helpful when you're asking for expertise and thoughts. Uh, people love to share that information with you and people really self-select and say, I really want an opportunity to tell you more uh, about where I see this work going. So it's something that I do anytime I start at an organization is really get that donor information or supporter information or subscriber information and say, well, where did you hear about us the first time? And how do you wanna learn more? What gaps are there right now? Uh, what do you want to know about your donation? What do you want to know about your support? What do you want to know about programming down the road? Do you want to know those five-year plans? <laughs> do you want to know uh, about this specific program? And then just get a good sense of, of how people would like to be engaged. Great. And the final strategy is uh, to focus on fundraising as relationship building. Building strong donor relationships leads to a much higher retention rate and challenges our views of fundraising as transactional. When donors are seen as authentic partners, they're people who deeply care about and wanna to contribute to the mission, there's a lot of opportunities for them to engage in multiple ways. So think about how donors are being thanked and followed up with, um, and that can even be in a chart that you make where what happens when someone comes into the organization? What happens when they donate? What happens after they make that first gift? What happens after the thank you? Where do those invitations go? Um, and I think this is a really important piece that can often get missed. And, uh, but I would say, again, it's a role that every single person at the organization has a space for, that they're thinking donors and supporters in every space, um, that they're really thinking about what that follow-up action looks like, and that there's an opportunity for people to continue to engage with the organization. So there's a fair amount of overlap in those four pillars or those four strategies. But the key takeaways are really about breaking down these fundraising and program silos, recognizing that donors come in as supporters first, and the program team works in concert with the fundraising team to support donor engagement and strong donor relationships. Great. So to review, uh, we talked about how fundraising can come from multiple sources. And I've asked you to dig into what types of funding you're interested in, 
and how we can think about different actions for different audiences. We reviewed fundraising activities and we recognize that fundraising is not just about the ask, but really includes this in-depth work on identifying people, lots of time on cultivation from the full team and stewarding gifts. Um, and this is work that everybody joins in concert and is committed to its success. And finally, we talked about community-centered fundraising and we offered some strategies to support fundraising at your organization. And that include building fundraising into programming and thinking through engagement strategies for supporters, either future supporters or existing supporters. So I'm gonna leave some space for questions and we can absolutely go through scenarios now. Um, but I also wanted to note, I'm gonna share this full presentation with everyone because I'm a fast talker and I'm also personally a visual person who likes to look at stuff later. So if you're anywhere in that space, um, hopefully that'll be useful. But I'm also gonna create a quick worksheet for you to build off the early worksheet that I created um, where it really talks about each of those stages. So identification and cultivation, uh, solicitation and stewardship, and it provides examples of each of those types. Uh, and they can be little check boxes where you can choose to do some of them, you can choose to do none of them. Um, you can talk with your team about what makes sense for your organization and what you could easily slide into your programming. It might take a little bit more work. Um, and hopefully it'll provide some clear next steps and things that you can take on. I would also encourage you to look back on the four strategies offered uh, and the activities there, which include a lot of talking about your mission as a team, uh, sharing information about your fundraising goals, and thinking about how you can engage in relationship building and how you can look at your existing programming and find spaces for engagement. Um, and start building in some space for that when you have time, uh, which is always the tricky thing. <laughs> um, but organizations that I've seen really work on this culture and really work on reducing the stress in fundraising and understanding it as a holistic space um, tend to have much stronger outcomes and, and a really good long-term plan for thinking about fundraising at the organization. Um, and I hope that that's what we leave today with. So with that in mind, I've put a couple open questions here just uh, thinking about if I had questions on this work, um, I wanted to offer space to reflect on the workbook. I know I asked some questions there about, can your team articulate your mission, um, the strengths of your organization, uh, who leads fundraising at the organization, what activities do you like doing, what do you not like doing? And some of that came up in the workshop, but we can also chat through it. Um, a review of the material that we went over, if there's anything you have questions on there. And then I also wanted to flag that a lot of the strategies are about team building. And some of us are coming from teams where we're the only team member, um, or we work with volunteers and it's not that simple. Um, and there definitely are spaces to change that strategy and think about what that work looks like internally and just for one team member. Um, but I wanted to offer space in case that question was coming up as well. So, so now I'm going to, uh, to open up the floor for questions and please feel free to, to send anything in the chat or just speak up in the, the Zoom call. So I definitely would love to share some of the thoughts that we are working on with one of the uh, organizations in our network. Uh, we've talked to them about um, building kind of a community-based recurring giving um, circle or, or membership or group type thing. Um, and, and what are some of the things that can be offered by being a part of this um, giving and participation? Um, I think one of the questions that we run into is um, while we've accumulated some great ideas from people on the team, like, you know, having an exclusive Zoom call to give developments about the organization before it's public or offering the training session, Mm -hmm. um, we've also th had ideas introduced like that are maybe not directly tied to the organization's work, but a part of its community building. So we really try to work with local businesses and local artists. So we want to like highlight a local artist so folks are aware of who in the community is aligned with the values and doing this kind of work. But I think the main question is as we kind of are running through this list of stuff, uh, what are some effective ways for organizations to be able to figure out how to balance what they want to offer when it comes to this kind of, you know, giving membership, giving table type approach um, for this kind of work? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, 
I would first look at cost per dollar raised. So for all of those activities, how much staff time does it take? Uh, how, what are the material costs? And rank them. Um, I, I would also give it a point for mission aligned. I think we always wanna focus in as much as possible on the mission. Uh, for any sort of membership drive, the lower capacity, the better, recognizing that you offer a, a unique item or unique experience. One thing I would suggest is if you had a list of things that you have talked about as a team, you might wanna reach out to all of your major donors and anyone that you flagged who has given more than once and say, hey, we're building out this new program. I'd love your expertise on it. You showed up three times for the organization in the past two years. You're the kind of person that has advice that we need to move forward. I wanna hear which one of these which of these three things resonates the most with you? And I want to hear if there are any gaps that I'm missing. And those are going to be the people that after you meet with them and have that conversation are going to join your program. Um, I found some success with that in the past, but I think it's also when we talk about community engagement, that's a really great tool is building a new membership program and getting people to buy into it before it goes live. And I, sorry, I might've misunderstood you and that might already be work that you're doing, in which case that's great. Um, but yeah, I think cost per dollar raised is the way you want to analyze this. And I would always be a little conservative because I, I find that a lot of people give, um, and the items are secondary or the, the experiences are secondary. So I would, I would lean into what your capacity is and what you're hearing from the community. Awesome. Thank you so much. No problem. Um, Jeeva, you've written, one funding source I was curious about was investing in venture capital. Is there any light you can shed on this particular source? I wish I had more light to shed on this source. What I can share is there are a lot of investing in venture capital uh, foundations. So spaces where they can invest in early stage efforts. Um, and there's a lot of platforms that do this work and then also foundations specifically. Uh, for investing in venture capital, I personally don't have a lot of experience with that work, but like any fundraising effort, it would be if you have those connections and prospects and you feel like it's worth moving forward. Uh, I've seen some people have success by finding a committee on their board who either has experience in the venture capital or investing space and equip them with the tools to outreach on their behalf so that it's peers reaching out to peers who have information and can provide support on that. Um, I, think, I think there's some drawbacks and some positives to it for sure. So I think that you would have to align as a team, but it's definitely something to look into. Thanks. Great, anything else? Jay, do you have any insights about crypto donations? <laughs> <laughs> do you actually? Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> I, I almost don't want to share this. I like, I can't believe I am excited to share this. I was reading a report uh, this week that said, so the majority of folks who are holding crypto donations are millennials. And last year, so 2021 calendar year, 50% of crypto stockholders who reported it on their taxes um, donated to charities with the average donation of $7,000. Um, 50% donated at least a thousand dollars of stock. So you need expertise in managing crypto and stock donations, but there are outside organizations that can support that. Um, it is a viable option. It requires a fair amount of oversight. <laughs> and, and with a volatile market like crypto, I think they're also, uh, it, it might be good to do some projections on what that looks like long-term. If that is a space you are interested in looking in, it's growing rapidly. Um, it is, I, I think it's interesting. Uh, if you are a tech nonprofit, I strongly encourage you to look into it. If not connect with a board member who knows, or, or a staff member or a team member or a volunteer in the community. Um, but it is really interesting data and I'm interested to see where it goes because it could be zero next year. It could be very different, but right now it seems to be increasing really intensely. Okay. Thank you, that's helpful. Uh, one of our fiscal projects is gonna be very tech-based, so um, uh, would be interested to talk to them about their fundraising plans. Um, okay, cool, thank you.
Is there any other question for Jay? Um, I was going to ask like if there's any other like fundraising toolkits or tools that you particularly use that could be helpful um, to any of us. Absolutely. Um, I the biggest thing for me is that I try to reduce time on identification and prospect work for foundations um, by signing up to a lot of automated and free services. So what I'll do after this call is I will share those with all of you so you can just sign up and input any information that you have and it'll send you a weekly review of opportunities. Um, I think that's really helpful in the field. I, uh, I think that outside of that, um, one of the best spaces that I've found for, for getting additional training and support has often been from existing supporters. So either asking the community is saying, look, we really wanna build out uh, skills in accounting or things like that, uh, and they can offer services or working with larger foundation conglomerates um, like the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, for example, offers all sorts of courses for grantees and, and um, a lot of small community foundations will offer a lot of free space, a lot of uh, training, and a lot of partnership connections. Um, so really looking at the foundations is more than just money, um, but potential supporters in other ways. Um, I'll also think there's like a lot of great webinar connections that you can grab, uh, both from Candid or uh, what used to be GuideStar in the Foundation Center um, and some other sources. So I'll include those in a follow-up email this week. Uh, and if anyone else has any, please feel free to respond to that and we can kind of crowdsource. Um, generally, I found the best support comes from other nonprofits who are really generous with their time and expertise. I was curious, um, talking to a lot of different um, leaders and in, in different efforts, you know, a lot of the concern that we hear and that we try to work with folks is just on processes. And I think, I forgot who it was, but it said reporting is the thing they hate the most. Uh, that, was have... me. that was me. <laughs> yeah, and that's very real. I, I feel that when you said that. <laughs> but. Uh, do you have any suggestions in that space when it comes to, uh, you know, I love the what you shared about, you know, the steps and the phases of this and how to make sure it's centered on, on work and capacity and things like that. But are there any um, tools or processes that you feel are just essential foundational things that, that would be good for folks to lean on uh, when they're, when they're doing from the from the ask, but really once the money starts coming in and then all the work after that. So processes um, to kind of almost automate things that you need to make sure that you're doing at every stage for, for specifically individual donations and maybe foundations as well. Yeah, th that would be good. I So I, uh, the biggest thing that has helped me is a program management tool. I use Asana pretty regularly and I have a template that I use for foundations and individual donors um, because it can be really easy to drop stewardship. It can be really easy to drop cultivation because the deadlines feel like the most important thing. And they are extremely important, um, but it can, it can lose sight of the other pieces. So I create templates for myself that involve check-ins with the program team for everything. So every four months I'm checking in and I'm making sure we're on track uh, so that when it comes time to do that reporting, I have form uh, several uh, check-ins with information on Asana to pull from. In terms of must-dos, I think, you know, it's really tricky because it'll be for each organization. I think that doing a really thorough review of all of your supporters prior to any event is really important. Making sure you're inviting everybody, making sure those invitations are going to as wide of an audience as possible. Um, I, I also think, and this might sound kind of naive, but I, I think asking for help is has been one of my uh, favorite pieces of advice and things I'd encourage. So we talked about reporting and the, how arduous that is. Uh, almost every foundation that I've reached out to, to say kindly, um, your reporting is too arduous. It is too much time. You want us to do the work. Here's 
let me show you the work, but don't make me do this. Um, they've been super understanding. Uh, or let me have more time for this. Um, so sometimes I think it's as, as simple as asking for that space when you can. Uh, but other than that, I would say a very strong project management tool in which you really outline those engagement steps. So inviting everybody before an event, reviewing the invitation list, following up with all attendees, and providing opportunities to donate at every stage. Um, and then you also have the evaluation tools. I would do that by biannually, so twice each year. Track your work, see where there are gaps, and then you'll see where you need to grow or can reduce um, your efforts. I wish I had an answer, like the most important thing you do is a thank you note, uh, but it really is gonna depend on your community. So we have about three minutes left. If there's no any, sorry, there's no other questions, um, maybe I'll wrap it up with final question for you, Jai. Uh, in terms of, obviously you've been doing this for quite some time. Um, do you have like a favorite fundraising campaign that you worked on that, that was also successful that you wanna share? Oh my gosh, I like, I like fundraising. <laughs> I think that's also the funny thing. I'm like, I think it's fun. Um, you know, you know what's funny? I have a favorite fundraising campaign that didn't work, but I loved it because I thought it, I think it's still the right call, um, which was really asking people to do story sharing, which was beautiful. And then building this shared map of everyone's experience. Um, but I will actually speaking back to, to what I had shared with Alexander earlier, my favorite and most successful fundraising campaign was the launch of a monthly giving program um, at an organization that hadn't done one before. And I went through all of the prospects, everyone who had ever donated more than once. And I set up meetings with 20 people over the course of six months. Um, and every single one of them donated at the highest amount because they were spoken with, because they were asked for their expertise, um, because they were invested in building the program from the ground up. And then when it launched, I already had 20 people at the highest level. So it was successful moving forward. Um, and that to me just reiterated the importance of investing that time in cultivating people before the ask and really bringing people in at every stage of fundraising. Um, I also love the one where it was, if you donate, you get these three amazing stickers and we work with the best graphic artists and it was my favorite thing in the whole world. Um, but that was also because they were awesome stickers and it was really cool. Uh, saying that, I think the earlier one is a better example of what I'm speaking to today which is that um, there's a lot of opportunities for your supporters to engage with the organization and really see a project through. Thank you for sharing that, Jay. Um, I wanna be respectful of your time. We're just about at time right now. So I just wanna say thank you again for this very um, helpful uh, conversation, presentations. I have one more question for Jay, really quickly. Jay, are you available for consultations uh, if folks want to follow up and kind of do a deeper dive on things? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I'll include all of my email information in the follow up this week. Okay. Um, and yeah, please feel free to reach out. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, this is being recorded, so we'll send a recording.